Curious about lip filler? Whether you want a subtle pout or bold plump, Juvederm lip fillers can give you a customized lip look. Juvederm Volbella XC and Juvederm Ultra XC can last up to a full year with optimal treatment, giving your lips added volume for smooth, natural-looking, and long-lasting results. Whether you're concerned about your thin lips or simply want fuller lips, ask about Juvederm lip fillers at your next appointment with your licensed specialist. And download the Alley app. That's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. The Starbucks cold brew you love is now available in a can. It's so good, you'll believe that too good to be true can be true. Like finding out that you and your crush have been listening to the same playlist on repeat. With the smooth taste of Starbucks cold brew in a can, sipping is believing. Available in three delicious flavors. Shop now wherever you buy groceries. Click or tap the banner to learn more. This is a special bonus episode of the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. This Oscar-nominated 80s flick may sound just like any other courtroom drama. Frank Galvin is a washed-up, ambulance-chasing attorney battling his demons in Boston. When he takes on a seemingly straightforward medical malpractice case involving a comatose woman, Galvin discovers a labyrinth of corruption and deceit within the legal system. With the odds stacked against him and his own personal struggles looming large, Galvin embarks on a quest for redemption, determined to uncover the truth and deliver justice. As the trial unfolds, tensions rise, alliances are tested, and the line between right and wrong becomes increasingly blurred. Although it might have been one of those movies our dads watched on cable while we sat around bored out of our minds, the film still holds up well even after 40 years. So dust off your law books, grab your Polaroid camera, and meet us in the courtroom as Laramie Wells and I discuss The Verdict from 1982 on this special bonus episode of the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. Are you telling me you turned down 210 grand? They sell justice. I myself would take it and run like a thief. I'm sure you would. They hide the truth. I can subpoena you, you know. Well, maybe you just better do that. They bend the law. When I walk out that door, the offer is withdrawn. They killed her. For this man, it's his last chance. I can win it. I can win this case. Paul Newman, the verdict ready. I'm Tim Williams, the mastermind behind the mic at the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. Joining me on each epic episode is a guest co-host who's as crazy about 80s flicks as they are about wearing parachute pants and solving Rubik's Cubes. We're diving into nostalgic treasures we saw at the local theater, rented on VHS tapes, or discovered on cable TV. From blockbusters that make you say, I feel the need, the need for speed. To hidden gems that'll have you screaming. They're here. It's a blast to relive these old memories and share our thoughts on what made these movies so special. We reminisce about our first time watch experiences, share our favorite scenes, and even discover fascinating behind the scenes tales about the cast and crew along the way. Haven't hit that subscribe button yet? What are you waiting for? Come on, do it. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. And hey, while you're at it, be a pal and drop us a written review along with a five-star rating to tell us what you think about us. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wastoids, dweebies, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. Take a day off and come hang out with us on social media. Just search 80s Flick Flashback on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And don't forget to bookmark 80sflickflashback.com for more gnarly content. Get out of town. I didn't know you did anything creative. Want to crank it all the way up to 11? 
Become a supporter on buymeacoffee.com for only $5 a month. Do or do not. There is no try. Click the link in our episode show notes, and while you're there, soak up the extra trivia and fun stuff that didn't make it into today's show. Thanks again for tuning in. Now, let's get right into today's episode. Welcome to the party, pal. Well, welcome in, everyone. Thank you again for being here for this bonus episode of kind of come back to our forgotten 80s flicks series that I started last year and want to do some this year. And this is the one that me and Larry one kind of want to do for a while. And so, as I said his name, let's go ahead and introduce him from Moving Panels podcast, longtime co host, the one with the most co host appearances, as we learned a couple months ago. It's still Larry crazy. Wells. That is so <laughs> crazy. Like this well, is not were, a forgotten one for me though. I am oh, yeah, to, yeah. I love this yeah. movie. Yeah, I don't hear people talk about it that much, even though it's you know highly regarded as one of the best courtroom uh, drama movies, uh, right up there with a few good men and um to kill a mockingbird, which I know was a book as well as a play. Yeah. Um, and I mean a, a movie and a play. When did you see the verdict for the first time? It was in college. Um okay. that's I can't remember exactly, but it was in college, so early two thousands. Uh, it, this was when I I decided as I was starting my movie collection that I was going to pick an actor that I really liked <laughs> and try to own everything that that actor had done. Right. And that actor right. turned out to be Bruce Willis. <laughs> who was in this movie. Yes, who uh, <laughs> I guess we go ahead and give that little bit of trivia. Uh, this was before he was famous. Uh, Bruce Willis is just a extra sitting in the courtroom at the mm-hmm. end of the movie. Uh, and makes himself very well known because he's sitting there with his arms up on the uh, the bench, like mm-hmm. you can't miss him if you're yeah. if you're looking. For and him. he's grinning like pretty big too, right? Yeah, in the scene. Yeah, and so smirk. So I was able to get a hold of this one on DVD, mm-hmm. and uh, and that was how I first saw it. Yeah, I don't think it's. I looked to see if there was a Blu-ray copy. I think there's some international copies, but there's not like a American printing of the Blu-ray that I've I've seen. But a lot of you know DVD special editions. So uh, I watched this for the first time this week. So this is one oh, wow. that I remember being heavily advertised on cable when I was a kid. When like '83, when it came on cable or debuted on cable, they were running it pretty heavily. Of course, it was Oscar nominated. It was you know, did well at the box office. But it because it was rated R, I wasn't allowed to see it. And I rem- and I don't know why this makes me laugh or why I, this is a memory I have. But I remember like some friends of my parents were talking about it like it was a really good movie and telling my parents they should watch it. And they're like, well, we're concerned about the language. And then they were like, well, you know, like most movies, it's kind of bad in the first like 10 or 15 minutes. But then after that, you know, it's not really there that much. And so that's always kind of stuck in my head. So when I watched it the other day, I was like, the language really isn't that bad. No, it, no, it's there's, not. Yeah, there's there's a few you know there at the beginning with Jack Warden, but it it it's you know for you know compared to R rated movies today, it's you know very it could be close to PG thirteen probably. I had not watched it until you know this week. It's one that I've wanted to watch. Like I know when we talked about it when I started doing the Forgotten Eighties flicks. This was one of the first ones that I kind of thought of because I was thinking about movies that were on cable when I was a kid that people don't really talk that much about. I remember this one, like I said, being heavily advertised on HBO that I never actually really got to see. And as I started watching it, I was like, maybe I have seen this before. So maybe I'd started it at some point, but I didn't remember anything like after the first five or 10 minutes of the movie. So maybe I saw the beginning as a kid or had started it when I got a little older, but never really, really watched it. So, uh, yeah, the beginning would not hook you. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't blame <laughs> yeah. that at all. Right. So how long have it been since you rewatched it for the podcast? It's probably been, I would say 10 or 12 years. Um, I probably rewatched it. Um, yeah, it's probably about 10 or 12 years. So it's, it's been a minute. Yeah. It's, it, I de- it's definitely rewatchable. Like I'll definitely watch it again. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. not one, it's not one that I'm going to want to watch every year, but it's a good, you know, like a few good men. I'm, I'm a, I love courtroom dramas. Like it's one of my favorite yeah. genres, 12 angry men, a few good men, you know, movies with men in the title. No runaway <laughs> jury, <laughs> 12 <laughs> you know, angry the, men. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, you know, I enjoy those type of movies. So it would be one when I'm kind of in that mood for a good courtroom drama. This is definitely one that I'll, I want to watch again. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not really one that you're like, you're constantly thinking, oh, I got to see that again. Yeah, or, yeah. And it, it's not one that 
you feel like a rewatch, you're going to see something you hadn't seen before. Right. I mean, this right. is a this is a pretty straightforward story. Like, yeah, there, yeah. there's not a. I mean, really, there's only one twist, and I honestly think you can telegraph that one. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, from the beginning. As I say, this one doesn't have that thriller aspect of it, where you're trying to solve a mystery or there's this race against time kind of a yeah plot point but it definitely it's really it's it's a straight up drama and it's really more of a character study wrapped around a a law case or a lawyer you know a courtroom case but it's really a story about frank and his kind of overcoming his demons or overcoming his shortcomings that he's kind of let him get to where he is well and and overcoming corruption really yeah oh yeah 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 for sure so well let's jump into story origin and pre-production the movie titled after the novel of the same name by barry reed was released approximately two years after the book was first published in 1980 the novel was the first of reed's works has been translated into many languages the film rights to the novel were purchased by richard zanuck and david brown a number of actors including roy scheider william holden frank sinatra Cary grant and dustin hoffman showed interest in lead role due to its strength Arthur Hiller was initially appointed to direct the movie while David Mamet was hired to write the screenplay. Is it Mamet or MMA? Do you know? I think it's Mamet. Okay, that's okay. Though Mamet had already made a name for himself in theater, he was still new to screenwriting. The producers were uncertain if Mamet would accept the job since he set high standards in his previous work. However, according to Lindsay Krauss, who was then married to Mamet, the film was a significant opportunity for him. Krauss also remembered Mamet struggling initially with Galvin's closing summation, but he finally came up with the scene after working on it all night. So Mamet wrote an original draft of the film, which ended after the jury left the courtroom for deliberations. This left the case unresolved, and both Zanuck and Brown believed this would not work for the film. Dude. Zanuck met with Mamet yeah, to convince him to rewrite the ending. However, Mamet was not convinced and told Zanuck that the ending he wanted was old-fashioned and would hurt the film. Zanuck's use of sarcasm to make his point did not go down well with Mamet either. Zanuck claimed his copy of the script was missing its final pages before telling Mamet the film title would need a question mark after it. Like the verdict? Like, <laughs> the what verdict? Was the verdict? <laughs> so Hiller disliked Mamet's script and left the project. The producers then commissioned another screenplay from Jack Preston Allen, which they preferred. However, Robert Redford obtained a copy of the script from Allen and suggested James Bridges as a writer-director. Bridges wrote several drafts of the screenplay and sanitized the lead character as he was concerned about playing a hard-drinking womanizer. However, neither the producers nor Redford were happy with the rewrites, and soon Bridges left the project. Redford then began having meetings with Sidney Pollack without telling the producers, which irritated them, so they fired Redford. <laughs> it's like like yeah. the, story, the story of this movie is actually a little bit more riveting than the, than the case itself in the movie, but uh, still good. So then Zanuck and Brown hired Sidney Lumet to direct the Lumet or Lumet. That one, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with Lumet, Mamet and Lumet. So they hired Sidney Lumet to direct the film and sent him various versions of the script. After multiple rewrites, Lumet felt that the story was losing its original rawness and opted for Mamet's original script. This decision was supported by Paul Newman, who also agreed to star in the film. Lumet had to only rework one or two scenes to give the trial a resolution which was originally requested by Zanuck and Brown. Unlike Zanuck, Lamet approached Mamet and received his approval to make that change to his original work. Whew, what a story. There you go. <laughs> it was a lot, but I was like, "There's." it, it was kind of cool to kind of hear how that came about. But yeah, it would have been a very different movie if there was no verdict at the end. Like, it, that would have been... Yeah, it's crazy that you would call a, a, uh, a story the verdict and then not have a verdict. Right. Which then makes me wonder, does the book end that way? And I would think probably not. I would think that the book would have a clear ending. I don't know. Or could I, you again, get away I, with that in the book? If, yeah. Yeah. I would you know, I mean, I've you've had me on things before that are based on yeah. books. I I'd be very interested to read the book. I just couldn't find no didn't know. It. <laughs> didn't know yeah. yeah, we talked about that before we recorded that Laramie didn't realize it was based on a novel, but he couldn't find the book anyway, which you know, nineteen eighty I'm sure it's out of print. Probably have to find a. Out of oh yeah, no, I one. yeah, I did find a copy on like eBay, but it was like a mm. hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And now these messages. 
Are you a fan of movies and TV shows inspired by comics? Ready for a podcast that dives deep into the thrilling world of adaptations? Well, look no further. Welcome to Moving Panels, the podcast where we discuss movies and TV shows based on, inspired by, and adapted from the world of comic books. This is your go-to podcast for all things comics on screen. I'm your host, Laramie Wells, and every Monday we explore the dynamic universe where ink meets action. We break down the classics, reveal hidden gems, and uncover the creative process behind your favorite adaptations. Subscribe to Moving Panels now on your favorite podcast platform and join us on this epic journey through the pages of comics and onto the big screen. Remember, new episodes drop every Monday. Don't miss out. Moving Panels, where every panel has a story and every adaptation is a blockbuster. Subscribe today, and I'll see you on the other side of the page. So let's talk a little bit about the director. Uh, Lumet started his career in theater before transitioning to film, where he gained a reputation for making realistic and gritty New York dramas, which focused on the working class, tackled social injustices, and often questioned authority. He was nominated five times for Academy Awards, four for Best Director for 12 Angry Men in 1957, one of my all-time favorite movies. Yep. Dog Day Afternoon in 75, Network in 76, and The Verdict in 1982, one for Best Adapted Screenplay for Prince of the City in 81. Other films include A View from the Bridge in 62, Long Day's Journey into Night in 62, The Pawn Broker in 64, Fail Safe in 64, Serpico in one. 73, Murder on the Orient Express in 74, The Wiz in 78. Didn't know that was part of his filmography. Yeah, that's crazy that he did that one. Yeah. The Morning After in 86, Running on Empty in 88, and Before the Devil Knows You're Dead in 2007. He received the Academy Honorary Award in 2004. I didn't know until I was doing the research that he did 12 Angry Men as well. So like the courtroom. Uh, yeah, no, I knew, he, I knew he did 12 Angry Men because uh, yeah, that's another one of my, my favorites mm-hmm. talking about courtroom dramas. Um, and I knew he did Fell Safe because that's another one that I yeah. just love. Uh, but yeah, there was honestly, there's a lot of those that you just mentioned. I was like, I have never heard of that. So <laughs> yeah, there's a few like some of those. You know, view from the bridge. I think Long Day's Journey to Night. Is that a Beatles movie? Was that was that one no, of theirs? No, no some, there, Hard Days. A, a hard Day's Night. Yeah, Hard Day's Night. Okay, yeah. Uh, the Palm Broker. Don't know. Uh, Serpico. I know is Al Pacino. Murder on the Orient Express. Good director. I mean, obviously, yeah. It's it's evident in this movie as well, but uh, has a good filmography for sure. All right. Well, let's jump into casting. There's not a whole lot. Uh, there's a few people on here that I'll I'll mention. I actually got more on here than I thought I did, but let's see. We'll 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 go through this pretty quick, I think. So of course you've got the legendary Paul Newman as attorney Frank Galvin. This is our first 80s flick we talk about Paul Newman. He won the Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in The Color of Money in 86. His other Oscar nominated performances were Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in 58, The Hustler in 61. HUD in 63, Cool Hand Luke in 67, Absence of Malice in 81, Nobody's Fool in 94, The Road to Perdition in 2002. I forgot he was in that. He also starred in such films as Harper in 66, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 69, The Sting in 73, The Towering Inferno in 74, Slapshot in 77, Fort Apache the Bronx in 81. He also voiced Doc Hudson in Cars in 2006. Mm -hmm. I have not seen a lot of Paul Newman movies, if I can be honest. So I'm not, I don't have much to base this on, but I know a lot of the things that I read about it talked about how this was like one of the first roles that he took where he was playing someone of his age, like an old, you know, someone older kind of past their prime kind of a role. So it was very, very different than what was expected. Yeah, because he had always been kind of the. Uh, well, I mean, it's not that he, he wasn't a leading man here, but kind of that, mm-hmm. you know, debonair, right? You know, leading right. man, the mm-hmm. yeah, the typical leading man, yeah, suave and debonair. Any other Paul Newman movies you've seen that you would recommend? So this is a this is a crazy one. It's a Coen Brothers movie called The Hudsucker Proxy. Yeah, I've heard of that one. I don't think yeah. I've ever seen it with, yeah. with Tim Robbins, where mm-hmm. it's a it's a fictionalized story of the guy who came up with the hula hoop. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And he plays the boss, like of mm-hmm. the, the guy that runs the company. So, so that's one. And then 
uh, another kind of forgotten movie, uh, but this one was from the 90s, uh, which, funny enough, is also got Bruce Willis in it, but he did a movie called Nobody's Fool mm-hmm. uh, with Bruce Willis. That's actually a pretty good one. Yep, um, 1994, that was on the list, yeah. Yeah, yeah so... So those I I admit you talking about not seeing Paul Newman movies. I've actually never seen The Color of Money. So I just watched that for the first time like yeah. last year or the year before. So and he's good in that too. Like that was yeah. that was that was a good movie, better than I thought it was going to be. I think I've got like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and The Sting like on my list of older movies to watch because they're ones that I haven't seen before. Yeah, so. but I yeah I had seen Butch Cassidy. I had seen uh, Slapshot. He was in the Towering Inferno. Did you mention yeah, that one? I mentioned yeah. that one. Yep, seventy-four. Yeah, yeah I I'd seen that one. Uh, of course, I've seen uh, Road to Perdition. We've covered it on my podcast. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. Because it is yep. it is based on a comic book. Yeah, I think you named the other ones I've seen though. Okay. All right, moving right along, we got Charlotte Rampling as Laura Fisher, his love interest in the movie. She was an icon of the swinging '60s. She began her career as a model. She was cast in the role of Meredith in the 1966 film Gr- Georgie Girl, which starred Lynn Redgrave. She soon began making French and Italian art house films. She went on to star in many European and English language films, including Stardust Memories in 1980, Long Live Life in 84, The Wings of the Dove in 97. In the 2000s, she became the muse of French director Francois Ozon, appearing in several of his films, notably Swimming Pool in 2003 and Young and Beautiful in 2013. On television, she is known for her role as Dr. Evelyn Vogel in Dexter. It started in yeah. 2013. Which would be the only other thing that I yeah. <laughs> recognized her from. Yeah, it's like she looked familiar to me, but like I couldn't place her. Like I'd see, maybe she just looks, you know, familiar or looks like other characters in other movies, I, but I didn't recognize her. I knew she was definitely European. Like she did have a little bit of oh, an accent. Oh yeah, you can tell the accent. So, uh, yeah, so that's like maybe she just looks that familiar like that. No, no offense to her, but I no, think no, no. She was, I think she was the weakest part of the movie, in my personal opinion. Yeah, and I felt like her story needed a little bit more to it. Like, of course, you know the big group. You know, kind of what you said. One of the twists, I guess, you would find out that she was hired by the other by the other firm. Which, as I said earlier, I think is pretty much you can you can see kind that of coming. figure that one out. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of see that one coming. One of the one of the many tropes of the courtroom movies. At first, it was just like, okay, they're they've got to have some kind of romantic element for the story, so that's why she's there. And then, yeah, as it keeps going, it's like, well, maybe it's more than that. And then, like I said, but I don't think she was given that much to to do. But yeah, her performance isn't that. Yeah, but even when she is on the screen, she looks like she's a deer in headlights for <laughs> a lot of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I don't know if it was a character choice because she knows like she knows what she's mm-hmm. actually doing. Right. And so it gives her a little bit of she looks like she's kind of, you know, scared. But mm-hmm. but yeah, there was just something that just felt off mm-hmm. um about her performance. Another one I guess probably the the second most famous person in this movie, at least for for me, was Jack Warden as attorney Mickey Morrissey. Warden's breakthrough film role was juror number seven, a salesman who wants a quick decision Mm -hmm. in a murder case in 12 Angry Men. Yeah, Warden guest starred in many television series over the years, uh, such as Bus Stop, The Fugitive. He received a a supporting actor Emmy for his performance as Chicago Bears coach George Hallis in the TV movie Brian Song and was twice nominated for a starring role in the 1980s comedy drama series Crazy Like a Fox. I remember seeing the commercials for that on, as a kid, but never watched it. <laughs> he was nominated for Academy Awards as Best Supporting Actor for his performances in Shampoo and Heaven Can Wait. He also had notable roles in The Man Who Loved Cat Dancing. Never seen that. No. <laughs> All the President's Men and Justice for All used cars in which he played dual roles. Problem Child and its sequel, as well as While You Were hey. Sleeping, Guilty as Sin, and the Norm MacDonald comedy Dirty Work. His final film was The Replacements in 2000 with Gene Hackman and Keanu Reeves. I didn't realize that was his final film. I didn't realize that either, but uh, that's another guilty pleasure movie of mine, The Replacements. It's like all these great actors in this terrible movie, but it's funny. It's not that bad. Yeah, yeah. I think the more I watch it, the more I find the things that are, you know, like outrageous about it, but it's still fun to watch. 
I still watch it every year around yeah. football season. Uh, when but, I see Jack Warden, I'm definitely 12 Angry Men. Mm-hmm. Uh, the replacements are definitely ones that I immediately, or not the replacement, sorry, uh, Problem Child. Okay. Uh, yeah, because he's Big Ben and Problem Child. And then you want to talk about forgotten 80s. Mm-hmm. There was a TV, uh, I, I don't know if you'd call it a miniseries, it aired for two nights. Uh, of a musical version of Alice in Wonderland that starred okay. like everybody famous uh, <laughs> at the time. And he played the owl in that. Okay. Okay. And I, I love that version so much. So I can pretty much anyone who was in that movie, as soon as I, you know, <laughs> if I see them, I go, they were in Alice in Wonderland. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to, so. I'll have to s- scour the internet to see if I can find that one. Oh, I have it on Since, DVD. So of course you do. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I have no doubt. But for me, because you know, we'd have to meet up somewhere to 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 see the get the DVD copy. But not that I haven't borrowed DVDs from you before. But but for me, I think his most iconic role for me is probably while you're sleeping. Like I I think that's the one oh, that I've yeah. probably seen the yeah. most that he's in. But he's is his voice is so undeniable or like so. I when I, as soon as I hear him talking, like I know that's who it is. So yeah. So then we got James Mason as attorney Ed Concanon, who is the you know other attorney he's up against in the courtroom. Uh, he starred in such films as A Star is Born in 1954, North by Northwest in 59, Stanley Kubrick's Lolita in 62, Warren Beatty's Heaven Can Wait in 78. He also starred in a number of successful British and American films from the 50s to early 80s. He was nominated for three Academy Awards, three Golden Globes, and two BAFTA awards throughout his career. Following his death in 1984, his ashes were interred near the tomb of his close friend and fellow English actor, Sir Charlie Chaplin. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. And he's the only one that kind of like his voice was like seen somewhat familiar. I couldn't say that I knew him from anything else, but he just, he had a presence to his character that I was like, I liked oh, yeah. him in the role, but I felt like, yeah, I'd maybe I've seen other people trying to have that same vibrato. Yeah, definitely felt like he was a, a former stage actor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I honestly, again, you would think as big of a movie guy as I am, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, start, you mentioned Star is Born, North by Northwest, Heaven Can Wait. Mm-hmm. I've actually never seen any of those. Me either. <laughs> and I know yeah. they're big movies. Like Right, uh, right. Yeah, but never, never seen any of them. All right, the next on the list, we've got uh, playing Judge Hoyle, Milo O'Shea, a name that I did not recognize, but definitely recognized him as the actor. Like, I was like, I've seen yeah. him in other stuff. So he starred as Leon- Leopold Bloom in Joseph Strick's 1967 film version of Ulysses. Among his other memorable film roles in the 60s were the well intentioned Friar Lawrence and Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. That's the controversial one, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. The one yeah. that there's there's like still lawsuits and whatnot going on about it. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I'm yeah. I remember watching that one in high school. In high school, read, no, I did after, too. After yeah, read the read the play. In ninth grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, and this is the one you probably remember. He's the villainous Doctor Duran Duran, who tried to kill Jane Fonda's character by making her die of pleasure, and Roger Vadim's yeah. counterculture yeah. classic Barbarella. Yeah, I will say that's not the first thing to come to mind, but <laughs> honestly, the dream team is the first thing that comes to oh, mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh wow, yeah. Because he's the doctor in the dream team. Yep, yep. So fun fact, in 84, he reprised his role as Dr. Duran Duran, credited as Dr. Duran, so Durand Durand, but credited as Dr. Duran Duran without the D for the 1985 Duran Duran concert film Arena since his character inspired the band's name, which I did not realize that. Yep. Uh, we so we have was, covered that one on my show yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> he was active in American films and television. So we mentioned he was in an episode of The Golden Girl. Oh, we didn't mention, but he was in an episode of The Golden Girls in 87. He also portrayed Chief Justice of the United States Roy Ashland in the TV series The West Wing. In 1992, he guest starred in the season 10 finale of the sitcom Cheers. And in 1995, in an episode of Frasier, he played Dr. Schlatter, a couples therapist who cancels the Crane counsels the Crane brothers together. They so, didn't have him listed as a dream team on here, but does he yeah. play the same character in both Frasier and Cheers? Yes. Oh, okay. I think so. I believe so. I didn't I didn't dig that. I didn't dig that deep in it. Yeah. All right. And then a few more we have here, people that I thought were worth mentioning. 
Lindsay Krause as Caitlin Costello Prouse. I'm sorry, as Caitlin Costello Price. She made her Broadway debut in the 1972 revival of Much Ado About Nothing and appeared in her first film in 1976, All the President's Men. For her role in the 1984 film Places in the Heart, she received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress. Her other films include Slapshot in 77, also with Paul Newman, mm. Between the Lines in 77, Prefontaine in 97, and The Insider in 1999. She also had a leading role in the 1987 film House of Games, which was directed by her then-husband, David Mamet. Oh, there you go. So that's why she was listed there. She was the victim, wasn't she? Was she? I'm trying to remember now. Because I, th I thought Costello, or no, Costello was the the nurse. No, she, the yes, nurse. she was yeah, the nurse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah the older, the, the older okay. nurse, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or the young. Oh man, I can't remember now. Hold on. No, 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 no. The younger nurse, the one that shows up yeah. at the end. Yes. Yeah, that that's, was. Yeah, Costello. I was like, yep, yeah, that's right. The one that is the surprise uh, witness at the end. Yeah. I'm going to have to start putting pictures next to my people. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, moving on. Edward Benz as Bishop Brophy. The only reason I mentioned him is he also was in 12 Angry Men in 1957. <laughs> there you go. Then we've got Julie Bovasso as Maureen Rooney. I think she was the older nurse. She was the older one. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of, in... lot of Irish names. And, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is Boston. So she was in Saturday Night Fever, playing the mother of John Travolta's character. She reprised the role for Staying Alive in 83. Then we've got Roxanne Hart as Sally Donaghy, the victim's sister. She looked familiar to me. So she played supporting roles in The Verdict, as well as Oh God, You Devil in 84. Hmm. She then, before she landed the role uh, opposite Christopher Lambert in Highlander in 86, is probably what I remembered her most from. She also played... Supporting roles in Pulse in 88, Once Around in 91, and Moonlight Mile in 2002. From 1994 to 1998, she played nurse Camille Schutt in the CBS medical drama series Chicago Hope. She's also guest starred on ER, Law and Order, Criminal Minds, Grey's Anatomy, The Closer, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. So she's been in a bunch of stuff. I've probably seen her in one of those other things. Yeah, it's like I used to one of those. She looked familiar, and another person looked familiar was James Handy, who played her husband Kevin Donaghy. He's been in multiple guest starring roles. His feature film and credits include Fifteen Minutes, Jumanji, Guarding Tess, The Rocketeer, Arachnophobia, Bird, Brighton Beach Memoirs, The Verdict, and K Not and K Nine. Gosh, I can't talk. Let's see, on television, he's been in episodes of The Young and the Restless, Criminal Minds, Alias, Cold Case, The West Wing. Third Watch, ER, Law and Order, Murder She Wrote, The Pretender, Quantum Leap, and Castle. He also appeared in 10 episodes of NYPD Blue. Oh, this is why I had him on here for you. In 2017, he appeared in Logan as the old doctor who treated Hugh Jackman after his first fight with X24. Oh, huh. okay. Don't really remember. I mean, <laughs> apparently, apparently yeah. if all he is is the doctor. Right. Uh, not really a major role. Not a major role, but. Very nice. And then I had to mention him, Joe Seneca as Dr. Thompson, the physician they bring in to be their, they wanted to be their star witness that kind of gets decimated on the, on the witness stand, mm -hmm. but he's best known for playing Willie Brown and Crossroads in 86 opposite Ralph Macchio. Uh, he also so played, not the, not the, uh, the Britney Spears maybe. No, <laughs> <laughs> he also played Dr. Meadows in the blob in 1988 and he was Dr. That. Haynes on the TV show, The Cosby Show. That's probably where I recognize yeah. him. Yeah. And so that's that's probably his most memorable role was being on The Cosby Show. Yeah. So I'm assuming that was a recurring role. Mm, yes. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I have I, I am a fan of The Blob. Uh, <laughs> even, the, even the lesser 88 version compared yeah. to the 58 one. And so we already, already talked about Bruce Willis' cameo. And also Tobin Ball. I think I didn't write his name down. He was also Tobin Bell. Tobin Bell from yeah. the Saw series, Dick right? Saw. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So he's Dick he's Saul also in Saul. he's also in the courtroom as well as one of the extras. Yeah, I found that out. I didn't know that. I haven't identified him in the crowd. But, gotcha. But definitely, like I said, you can definitely <laughs> identify Bruce Willis sitting there. You gotta remember he 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 looks like he does for moonlighting. So mm -hmm. you're not yeah. you're not looking for bald. <laughs> Bruce Willis, right. or thin-haired Bruce Willis. He's, he's there you go. Good, yeah, but he's definitely dressed like David Addison from from Moonlighting. Moonlighting. 
kind of sitting there with the same attitude as David <laughs> Addison would. All right. So iconic scenes. I don't know if this one has really an iconic scene that I would say besides him playing pinball at the beginning, <laughs> because that's the scene that I remembered watching it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't know about iconic. Um, Cause again, this is a forgotten film for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. It, it's so not it, one that you're going to see, you know, a quick clip of, you know, right. You know, eighties montage, montage right. movies. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't, I agree. There's not really an iconic scene. What about favorite scenes for you? And I'll say up front, I don't really have one. Not that I don't think there are great scenes, but this isn't that type of movie. I feel yeah, like this, this is, a, this, it's, yeah. it, it's not, it's telling such a story. It's a slow paced drama that isn't trying to be, it's not very, I say flashy or flamboyant. That's not really the word, but you know, it's not trying to wow you in any way. No. It's just really telling a story. It's it a is. very and basic, a very good story. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Almost like, you know, like 12 angry men, like, uh, uh, that could, could easily be done in a, on a, on a theater stage, just being engrossed in the story. Which they have turned this into a stage play. Oh, I'm sure. I, do, yeah. I, I did when I was trying to find the book. I did discover mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, I don't know about a favorite scene because there's really not. Again, I wouldn't say there's a scene that when I think of this movie, I'm mm -hmm. automatically thinking of a scene. I will say that when I think of this movie, and this may sound silly, <laughs> I think of his office. There's something about his office that I just—it's the window okay. and the the view where it's there's clearly some sort of arch right outside that's got this mm -hmm. uh, decor. There's just something about his office that always sticks into my head with that, uh, <laughs> that semicircle, you know, type window that mm -hmm. he has. And yeah, I mean, that's really it. Like there's, there's just the, the window. That's it. <laughs> I will say I do. I do really like the power of the scene when he goes to visit the, the victim. Yes. And he's taking the pictures mm -hmm. and really for there to be very little dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, really the most dialogue you get is from the nurse that comes and tells him he can't be there. Right. Um, and then he just very quietly says, I'm, I'm her lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, but just the, the acting that Paul Newman does in that scene mm -hmm. without saying words, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's really the turning point for him where this turns from, a case where he's just trying to make money right. to a case where he is actually going to fight for mm -hmm. what is right. So. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting choice too there. Cause you actually watch the Polaroids come into focus. Yeah. Which I know has significance because I know it's talking about, you know, that's, it's that turning point for him where things that have been out of focus begin to become into focus for him or that's, mm -hmm. you know, one person's commentary on it, but yeah. But yeah, like him seeing her through that camera for some reason gives him an epiphany of, you know, this is this needs to be more than just another case. There's a person's life here that's been lost and yeah. uh, will never be the same. Yeah, because I mean, they clearly make it known, you know, between him and Jack Warden's character that mm -hmm. the only reason he got this case was to settle it and make right. a whole bunch of money. Right, right. So, yeah, for that for that to happen and him again to risk everything uh, on this case, you know, that was a and it's a really good performed scene. It's, yes. It's, yeah. So I'm not oh. again not going to say favorite, but mm -hmm. it's one that when you watch it, that scene really sticks out. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Props to Paul Newman. Of course, we know how, what a great actor he is, but this is one of those performances that kind of reminds you how great he was. Yeah. in a role and how well he did. Like you said, it's not, it's not over the top. It's not, he's not trying to do too much. It's a lot no. of subtle oh, yeah. subtleties and subtext that you, that you get. Even when he gets frustrated, which hit, which you get frustrated with him uh, in the courtroom, especially with the judge. Mm, who, oh yes. Yeah. And he yeah. gets into that. Don't try my case for me. And mm -hmm. uh, all that. I mean, yeah. And he, but again, he does it without going too mm -hmm. hard at it, which mm -hmm. again, it's just a, again, a, a great just indicator of how amazing of an actor Paul Newman was. Mm -hmm. And now these messages. No. 
now playing on a cell phone near you. A show for all the manly men out there, where guys talk about their favorite movies and what they can teach us about being a man. Featuring the coolest guests. Murder somebody is not like killing an ant. The most gratifying laughs. It's Tombstone, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and a fresh take on movies like you've never heard before. This will be the thing that gets written on his proverbial tombstone. We aren't here to criticize the movies you love, but to praise them for how they apply to our lives as husbands, fathers, and really all men in general. So buckle up your seatbelts, because Manly Movies is here. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or your other favorite podcast catcher. And remember, man up. Curious about lip filler? Whether you want a subtle pout or bold plump, Juvederm Lip Fillers can give you a customized lip look. Juvederm Volbella XC and Juvederm Ultra XC can last up to a full year with optimal treatment, giving your lips added volume for smooth, natural-looking, and long-lasting results. Whether you're concerned about your thin lips or simply want fuller lips, ask about Juvederm Lip Fillers at your next appointment with your licensed specialist. And download the Alley app, that's A-L-L-E, the official loyalty program of Juvederm, to save on treatments. For important safety information and to find a licensed specialist, visit Juvederm.com. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Not for people with severe allergic reactions, allergies to lidocaine, or the proteins used in Juvederm. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. There's a risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. Talk to a licensed specialist to find out if it's right for you. The Starbucks cold brew you love is now available in a can. It's so good, you'll believe the too-good-to-be-true can be true. Like finding out that you and your crush have been listening to the same playlist on repeat. With the smooth taste of Starbucks cold brew in a can, sipping is believing. Available in three delicious flavors. Shop now wherever you buy groceries. Click or tap the banner to learn more. All right, well, let's hit some scenes or trivia from scenes. Maybe it'll help us think of some other parts of the movie that we might have uh, forgotten or haven't talked about yet. Uh, Sidney Lumet said that if anyone had ever sent him the book to read before he decided to direct the movie, he would have told them there was no way that the material in the book could ever be adapted to film, which you and I had kind of mentioned before. Is like I don't think the film really follows – you know, a direct adaptation of the book. It's probably, you know, there's probably elements of the story that make it into the film, but with all the different rewrites, it seems like there wasn't, they're not trying to follow the exact same story. Maybe the general, general idea of the case and maybe Frank, um, his character. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I'd like, I'd like to, to read the book to see mm -hmm. how, how close they came, but yeah, I still, I mean, but you've even made it more interesting with the fact that there is no decision made at the end of, uh, of the book. I really kind of want to know how that, how that actually reads. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm saying, I don't know if that's the way it is in the book. I, I, I was curious yeah. if it is like, that's why Mamet wanted to do it that way. If he wanted to keep it that way prior to filming, the Met held extensive dress rehearsal standard practice for his films, but not common in Hollywood productions. Newman was appreciative as that proved crucial in developing his performance, giving the time he needed to tap into the emotional bankruptcy of his character. Uh, Frank uses eye drops to hide the redness in his eyes caused by alcoholism. According to the DVD commentary by Sidney Lumet, this was Paul Newman's own idea. Oh, that very was nice. Good. good little touch. Uh, the producers were reluctant to keep the scene where Newman strikes rampling, believing it would turn the audience against his character and even damage his public image. Newman insisted on keeping it, believing it was right for the story. I will say that was a very shocking. I, it's a shocking, but I, I agree. I think it's, I think it's fitting. I yeah. mean, yeah, she just about single-handedly ended his career mm -hmm. uh, and all mm -hmm. the trust he had put into her. And yeah, I mean, it, it is shocking to see a man strike a woman, but mm -hmm. um, I think, I think the scene was handled well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's it's not it's the confrontation okay. and then the very sudden and dramatic slap and then you do have all the other men come to defend her mm -hmm. and hold mm -hmm. holding him back but even the way as much as i talked about how i think she was the weakest point uh the way that she even without speaking kind of suddenly mm -hmm. lets even the other patrons know like no it's okay 
I deserved this. You know, she kind of mm-hmm. relates. I know all why that. he did it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good scene. So we're kind of moving into the end of the movie, which I think is what most people say. Most people remember like that. We'll just talk about it. So according to DVD commentary, um, Paul Newman had to perform the summation scene twice due to a hair in the gate of the camera. The Met said it was the only time in his entire career where the second performance in that situation was better than the first. And he did that like he did all that in one take. Like he didn't need to be yeah. breaking up. So which I thought was great. A lot yeah, of long, actor. a lot of long sequences, like not a lot of camera cuts like we see in today's movies, like a, a lot of long uh, cuts. The last sequence was not in the script. Sidney Lumet devised the scene with Paul Newman and Charlotte Rampling wanting to show that Laura was drinking while Frank was not. Newman confirmed that Frank, Frank was drinking coffee at the end. This is meant to show that Frank has escaped from his personal hell while Laura has brought herself into one. Frank's refusal to answer Laura's phone call is his refusal to give in to his old vices. Yeah, I, I'm i not a huge fan of that ending. Yeah. Um, I get the moment, but I just, I, I kind of wish there was something else at the mm-hmm. end. Uh, yeah, to, to just have, I, I think one, it goes on just a little too long. Yeah, yeah. Of of just cutting back and forth to her laying in bed, mm-hmm. um, calling him up, and then him sitting at his desk just staring at the phone. Mm-hmm. And then it just rings and it just rings. And mm-hmm. again, I get the scene, I get the moment, but I just after such a great story with you know the uh, you know I mean maybe a little cliche, but the triumphant you know <laughs> right little guy little guy wins mm-hmm. uh, at the end. I think it just it it took it down a little bit in my mm-hmm. opinion. Well, I think that was so they added that because originally the scene it was supposed to end with just him walking out of the courthouse and it was like a long shot of him coming kind of walking down the street or walking away from the courthouse. I probably would have been fine was, with that yeah. though. You know, give him some triumphant music, have him come out, maybe have another moment where the sister and husband walk mm-hmm. by him and he just kind of gives them a little nod. You know, when they walk off and he just kind of looks around, you know, just taking in the moment. And then, yeah, have him start walking and just mm-hmm. have the credits roll as we just watch, watch him walk down the street. Yeah, I think that would have been just I, I would have loved that ending. Yeah. As this legal drama features a woman in a permanent vegetative state, the picture was made and released hot on the heels of the 70s Karen Allen Quinlan legal case, which was fresh in the minds of the public consciousness and had recently been the subject of the 1977 telemovie in the matter of Karen Ann Quinlan. The case involved a brain-dead patient whose parents objected to keeping her on a respirator and without hope of recovery. Doctors refused to comply due to their fear of the threat of a murder charge. At the time of filming the verdict, Quinlan had been in this state of limbo for over six years. So there was this very real part of the story that was in the mind of people at that time. But once again, it's just a story. Case in point, both lawyers, Galvin and Concanon, engage in unethical conduct for which both would have been subject to disbarment. Oh, yeah. Galvin received a settlement offer from the archdiocese, and yet he never told his clients about the offer or asked mm-hmm. them if they wanted to accept it. That is unethical and prohibited, con- prohibited conduct on the part of a lawyer. His clients revealed that his opponent, Concanon, told them about the settlement offer. When a lawyer knows that a party is represented by counsel, the lawyer is prohibited from speaking directly with that party in the absence of their attorney. Conconnon also engages in unethical conduct when he pays Laura to get close to Frank and learn his trial strategy and secrets, which he does. That conduct is also expressly prohibited by the lawyer's code of professional responsibility. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. No surprise. Yeah. I, I, yeah, <laughs> it's I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the law. Uh, clearly. Um, I mean, but I think that's part of the story mm-hmm. it, because there's also the the story of Galvin, of Frank, that he's coming back from an an incident where he was the scapegoat, yes. essentially yes. for right. for a law firm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just showing how there's corruption in the system, which just makes it that much better for him to pull off the win at the end. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I also wonder, like, what in in the real world in the legal mm-hmm. world, which, which you could also have a uh, hold against uh, the judge because there's yeah. de- I definitely yeah. think that the, some of the stuff he does, mm-hmm. he could not have actually gotten away with right. in an actual court of law. Yeah. Um, which is why I like how he threatened him in the, in the chambers 
we're like, you know, I'll, I think he says something. I'll take I'll take this right up to the to the board or something. I'm, I I can't remember the exact line, but I know he challenges yeah. him on that and saying, you know, if you don't the uh, let me do let me try this case, then I'm I'm going to take it to your higher ups. Uh, final trivia: The movie was nominated for five Academy Awards: Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Adapted Screenplay, but failed to win any Oscars in any category. No. I mean, I I'm curious to to know what beat it out, but I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. I think Gandhi won, if I remember correctly. Okay. I oh, think yeah. yeah. I have to go back. Yeah, it was a tough year that year. All right, box office and critical reception. The verdict opened in three theaters on December 10th, 1982, limited release. It debuted at 14 behind Gandhi and Sophie's Choice at 12 and 13, respectively, which also opened to a limited release. The other major releases held the top three spots. 48 Hours was number three. Airplane 2, the sequel, was number two. And The Toy was number one. The following week, it opened wide and moved up to number eight and eventually moved up to number three, where it stayed for the four weeks of January 1983. So it stayed at number three for the whole month of January, which was pretty, pretty good. So definitely word of mouth, I'm sure, helped it as it stayed in the theater for a good long while. So so I will say I just looked up the Academy Awards from that okay. year. So, yes. So pretty much Gandhi beat it out in everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Gandhi beat it for Best Picture, Best Director. Ben Kingsley beat Newman for Best Actor. Best actor. Uh, but Best Supporting Actor, because Gandhi wasn't nominated in that category, mm-hmm. uh, Louis Gossett Jr. Oh, beat, for... out, beat out James Mason. Yeah, Louis, for a, an officer and a gentleman. During a gentleman, yeah. Uh, I'm not against that. Mm-hmm. But but just to, to, again, throw out, what the uh, the Oscars were like then, and just mm-hmm. so best actor, you got Ben Kingsley who won mm-hmm. for Gandhi. The other nominees were Dustin Hoffman for Tootsie, mm-hmm. Jack Lemmon for Missing. I will say I've never seen Missing, but Jack no. Lemmon. I mean, come yeah. on. Uh, Paul Newman, of course, for the verdict, and Peter O'Toole for My Favorite Year. Again, not a movie I'm familiar with, but Peter right. O'Toole again, classic actor. Supporting mm-hmm. actor, Louis Gossett Jr. won. Charles Durning for uh, best little whorehouse in Texas. <laughs> One of my favorite roles. Right. Uh, John Lithgow for The World According to Garp. Wow. Um, yeah, maybe not one of the greatest uh, Robin Williams <laughs> movies, but again, John Lithgow, legend. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, James Mason for The Verdict. Uh, and then Robert Preston for Vic- Victor Victoria. Okay. Yeah, Blake uh, Edwards yeah. movie. I mean, good grief. <laughs> Just looking at some of these. Uh, I mean, Meryl Streep won for Best Actress for Sophie's Choice. Yeah. Jessica Lange won for Supporting for Tootsie. Man. And then it lost, what was the other one that it was up for? Best Adapted Screenplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it lost to, again, that movie Missing, which, again, okay. I have never heard of. But, yeah. I have to add that to the but, Forgotten 80s flicks list. Yeah. But man, that is a legendary group of, of people mm-hmm. nominated. I mean... Best Director, Richard Attenborough, Wolfgang Peterson, Steven Spielberg, Sidney Pollack, and Sidney Lumet. Yeah. Hey. Crazy. <laughs> Tough year. E- yeah. E.T. was also nominated for Best Picture that year. Wow. I don't think I knew that it was nominated for that. Yep. E.T. Missing. Again, whatever this mm-hmm. missing movie is, apparently <laughs> it's, it's got to be good. Right. Uh, yeah, E.T., Missing, Tootsie, and The Verdict were the other nominees. And again, Gandhi won. Yeah, back when there was only like four or five in that yeah, category. Yeah, not, not, not ten that they have now <laughs> or how, whatever right, they've done right. now. Well, since we know it was a good movie, the critical reception, <clears throat> I have never seen this so far. I mean, I say it's not out there, but first time for me. Rotten Tomatoes, 88% on the tomato meter and an 88% audience score. So awesome. exactly the same between critics and audience and then <laughs> funny enough on imdb 7.7 7 out of 10 with viewers and a 77 on metacritic so okay whether you're a rotten tomatoes or imdb it seems like you agree with the critics on either one yeah so where are you yeah is it's it, a good is movie it, yeah i'll say was it in it's, the 70s it's in the, like it's the, no it's 80s? in the 80s it's in the 80s yeah it's in the 80s yeah. yeah again it's it's not a a movie that you're going to think about an awful lot. It's not a movie that you're going to, you know, want to rewatch or, you know, even, you know, 
ask people like, <laughs> oh, hey, have you ever seen The Verdict? You really should see The Verdict. Right. Um, but it is a really good movie. So yeah, it's yeah. definitely for me, it's it's in the 80s. Yeah, I agree. I think I don't know if 88 is not that close tonight because I think rewatchability is definitely rewatchable. Like I said, it's not one that I'm going to want to watch like every year, every couple of no, years. Maybe. You've got to have some time between it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but <laughs> you have to but, have time to forget some of it. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, amazing. I say amazing direction, great writing, amazing performances, especially, you know, Paul Newman, Jack Warden, of course, is great. Um, even the other attorney, James Mason. James Mason, yeah, yeah. So I, Bruce Willis is great. Bruce Willis, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three seconds of screen time, but yeah. yeah, but just if you're if you're looking for a great movie just to watch as like an acting or directing or writing masterclass, this is one that's on that list of probably one of the, you know, one of those top tier dramas that is really well done. So oh, yeah, and yeah. once again, loved by critics and audiences alike, which is very rare. Even you know as much today as even it was in in the early '80s as well. Yeah, if you had, I mean, it, again, we may be classifying it as a forgotten '80s movie, but if you've never seen it, I 100 you should mm-hmm. see it. Yeah, again, yep. it may not go on your list or anything as to best movies, but it is it is an amazing movie that really deserves a lot more to not be forgotten. Is yes, what I, yeah, what I'll say. I agree. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for joining. I want to thank Laramie for joining as well. But be sure to follow, subscribe, rate, and review Moving Panels, as well as 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. Support the show through buymeacoffee.com. Buy a t-shirt or a sweatshirt from the website, tpublic.com, or our website, 80sflickflashback.com. Send us an email at info at 80sflickflashback.com. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with someone who loves 80s flicks. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. That's it, people. I'm Tim Williams for the 80s Flick Flashback Podcast. Good night, good people. still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Are your eyes overstimulated? <laughs> Relax and protect them with Essilor Eyes and Lenses. Switch to Essilor Eyes and Lenses and find your local Essilor expert at Essilor.com. Your teen requested a ride, but this time not from you. It's through their Uber teen account. You drive your teenager around a lot to their friend Jacob's house, their other friend Jake's house, to James's, to Jaden's, to Jalen's, to... Oh, uh, Mom, this is Jake's house, not Jacob's. Now with an Uber teen account, your teen can request a ride under your supervision. They'll ride with a highly rated driver, and with live trip tracking, you'll follow along the whole ride to their friends' houses that all sound the same. Add your teen to your Uber account today. See app for details. Bye, Mom.